Hello, everyone. This is Liz Burnett. It is such a blessing to be here today. I'm calling and coming here from Kingdom Elegance Magazine, and I am blessed, as always, to join my dear sister in the Lord, Helene Cruz. Hello. Helene is an accomplished Christian author and holds the title at Pace University of Director Employer Relations, Pace University Career Services. Her books include An Eternal Affair and Joy Comes in the Morning. And my background includes 15 plus years in human resources, recruiting, resume writing, and career coaching. And together we bring to you our career success series, Secrets from a Christian and biblical perspective, of course, so that you reach your professional goals for the kingdom and to make an impact in our world. So today's topic, life lessons from two of Helene's blessed books, An Eternal Affair and Joy Comes in the Morning. Now we did a part one, this is part two, the <laughs> life lessons learned from these uh, amazing books that I've had the chance to read and I've been so blessed by. Hello, sis. <laughs> hello, hello, sister Liz, and hello, everyone. Thanks for welcoming me back. Thanks for part two. Thank you so much for being here, sis. You are an amazing blessing to the body of Christ not just to your city of New York, New York, of course, but to um, Pace University and all the ministry that you do for so many. So thank you for all that you do for the body of Christ. And we're going to talk about your books today. I'm so excited to talk about your books. Um, before we get started, though, says, where can we find an eternal affair and joy comes in the morning? Well, um, to make it easy for you, you can find them on Amazon, but to make it easier for you, there is my website URL on the screen, cruisecontrolcoaching.com. So when you go on there, there's going to be a section for resources. The books will be there with a little blurb on each and it will lead you to Amazon. So I suggest you go through my website first, which yes. takes you to Amazon to get a little taste, um, a synopsis, a summary, you know, a quick summary of each book. Wonderful. And they truly are a blessing, everyone. I really recommend them as a beautiful way to start your devotions, um, you know, after you uh, pray, of course, read the Bible, just add this to part of your uh, walk with the Lord. It will bless you because it blesses you greatly. So, to, you know, our first question is actually centered around, sis, there are books in a lot of um, men and women in, in the Lord, and they have ideas in their minds and don't know where to start. So my first question is actually, um, you've described the entire process of authoring books as losing the script. So for any future authors who are listening, would you explain this insight of what they can gain from writing their first book? Great. Um, so yeah, we, you and I came together and did the, our, my very first broadcast with you in March about six yes. months ago. So this is the part two to that. Yeah. Um, because our other sessions have been more of the, the uh, career side, which I do coaching on and I, uh, on the side of, of being at pace. Um, but I'm really, it's timely that we're doing the part two, six months yeah. later, because I'm really getting to launch the grief coaching side, which is a service that I offer. So it's, it's so timely. Um, because some of what I talk about in the first book and then the second book is dedicated to loss. So I mm -hmm. um, just wanted to put that out there. But really, it, I, the irony in, in your question is um, we're talking about writing. And then I say the process for me was losing the script. How do you lose a script if you're looking to write? You're, yes. you're, you're looking to gain a script. You're looking to gain gain a work. But mm -hmm. what I mean by losing the script is really your agenda, your thoughts, everything that you're writing. If God's not in it, if, it, if it's the Holy Spirit is not giving you direction mm -hmm. or support, um, 
you, you, you have to take another direction. Um, so that's what I mean by losing the script and also losing the ego, losing what you think you know, yes. um, losing your idea of what should be written, um, especially when you're writing on behalf of others, um, yes. you know, really getting out of your own way. Um, sometimes you hold a certain idea and God's like, no, that's not how it's supposed to look. Get out of the way. <laughs> Get out of the way. Yeah. So that's what I mean by losing the script, having the ego strength, having the wisdom, the godly wisdom and the knowledge to say, this isn't from God. This is me. This is my ego. This is my agenda. Now, the first book in Eternal Affair, I, I always say, and I haven't said this on your show, but I say uh, amongst people and when I speak that, that was kind of the theory. That yes. was the first book. That was the theory. And the second book is more like the the application, like really like life stuff. Yes. Um, and I can even see the differences between the two because the first book was written um, in 2011, published the end of 2012. Yes. And then the second book was 10 years later. So why did it take 10 years? I could have thrown... 10 other books together, but they weren't from God. It mm -hmm. wasn't the timing. So a lot was learned between the first and the, and the second book. There was some ego in that first book. I thought I knew it all. And, you know, God's like, no, you need to, you, you need to be humbled a little bit. You know, you need to be humbled, need, need to be humbled a lot. So that's what I mean by losing the script, submitting to the Lord, waiting on him because right. it was prophesied. And we'll talk about that shortly. It was prophesied that I, I would be writing. But I think the first book, the 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 mind was in it, the heart, but the, the Holy Spirit wasn't totally guiding it. It was me. I mean, it's anointed. But I felt really the heart and I felt like a thousand percent in the second book when I lost it. And I said, OK, rewrite, edit, yes. re-edit. Let me walk away from this. Got to do it again. And I was OK with that because I there was a lot of maturity and growth and the Holy Spirit was totally in it. And I let him be in it. I love that. So it took a certain amount of humility, mm -hmm. like you said, to. Um, to step back and allow the Lord to come in yes. in this process. So you have to depend on God. I, I actually remember when you were writing the first book, <laughs> you don't give yourself enough credit because I remember there were times that you were praying. <clears throat> Do, do you remember that? We we prayed together. That was our time in 2011 to 2012. Yes. We are, and we'll talk about that next session. <laughs> yes, yes. And and fasting, if I'm not mistaken, you fasted uh, yes, yes. a few times uh, during that time. So one thing that uh, I noticed that when we go into ministry as a body of Christ, sometimes there are and this is off topic, but sometimes uh, there's warfare, spiritual warfare. I know you've dealt with it. I know I've dealt with it. And many of our audience members have dealt with it. So did you face spiritual warfare when you were writing? I, I just want to allow an opportunity for encouragement to anyone who might be authoring if they are dealing with spiritual warfare of delay or uh, personal chaos in their lives or anything like that, what would you suggest in relation to the first question, which is um, submitting your work to the Lord, submitting when you face personal um, battles, what would you do on the spiritual front when writing? Well, with the first book, it was 2011 to 2012. My grandmother was dying. Yes. At that time, um, you and I started praying together uh, 2011 to 2012. And then prior to that, Brother Derek Jones and I from from Pace were praying a year before that. So there was prayer that was going into so much. So we were prayed mm -hmm. up and still even when you're prayed up, there's battles in, yes. in, the, in the warfare zone. Um, I, 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 to be honest, I remember that season. I, I was physically ill a lot with headaches, pressure mm -hmm. headaches. And one woman who was a prophetess who, who, who would speak prophetically in my life. She's a, a friend of the family, their, their mom. Um, she even said, I can, I can feel your headaches. Like your headaches are so heavy that I feel them in the spirit. Yes. So I was getting headaches. I was having, you know, stress at work. Um, battles are going to come. Yeah. But yes. I, I believe that 
for the first book, the and, and even the second book, the battles came more afterwards. Interesting. Like, in other words, when it was rolled out, when it yes. was, okay, it was time to showcase, for lack of a better word, I, you know, not showboat, but showcase right. the work. I felt like there was, there was jealousy, there was envy, there was, there was a whole lot of stuff. Yes. There was strife, there was discord. Um, I, I remember that it, it was heavier after when the book was revealed and delivered. Mm -hmm. So that can happen too. That can yes. happen because it, it, it's God's work. It's God's work. It's, it's a, it's a faith-based, those are faith-based books. So right. definitely I guess the, 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 the counsel, godly counsel is to continue praying, fasting, have your prayer partners. Not everybody knew I was writing book. My own family didn't know I was writing that first book. I gave yes. them a copy a hard copy, beautiful. It was a beautiful hard copy. Each family member at Christmas time, because that's when it was uh, um, published yes. two weeks before Christmas. So they were surprised. And I didn't even want to tell my family because sometimes you put the seed out there too, too early um, and it, it gets pulled, it gets pulled out of the, the, the garden, so to speak, or the weeds pop up, so to speak. So not that family, I'm not saying family does this, but mm -hmm. anyone, when you speak, when you speak into something that's still growing and still marinating and percolating and, and God is still working on, you want to be careful. So okay. that, that first book, I did not reveal the second book. I did have to share with many, those who were featured in the book and those whose story I was writing in that second book. So it, it was a little bit of a different process because I had to share with people in order to get their testimonies and get right. their their authorization to publish. But that first book, I, I kept it on the DL down low. Yes. Because I didn't want to ruin the seed. I didn't want to stomp on or spoil the seed. I wanted to, to reap that harvest. So some of your life lessons, because the topic today are the life lessons oh, yeah. you're authoring. <laughs> <laughs> two beautiful books. So for any aspiring authors, um, what I have gleaned from your wisdom just now, pray for the entire process, not just before, but during and even after. So pray fast if you have to. Uh, be careful and watchful about who you announce your projects to. I know one thing for me, sis, and uh, I'm not an author yet, but uh, one thing that I am careful to do, I keep any projects only to my circle and my circle are prayer warriors. We cover and smother as, as <laughs> smother in prayer. Love it, love it. I do not go outside of that. You have to be watchful about what you say. And so yes. I agree with you completely about that. Be careful with whom you share mm -hmm. those uh, goals, those projects that God is giving you, because you want to, you don't want to just bring warfare to you unnecessarily because it's going to come. Exactly. But um, if you do share, be watchful who you are sharing uh, your projects, your mission, things like that. Be be watchful. So thank you. Cover thank you. prayer. Thank you. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> be watchful about uh, who you talk to, and and um, yeah, just just be watchful. And and so you were discussing about um, people prophesying to you. And there was a brother and sister in the Lord who prophesied your books. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can. Um, in early 2011, it was prophesied um, by uh, a, a, a pastor um, who was part of a, a, a ministry, a church that would, had a prophetic ministry. Uh, we went to a Bible study and this is in the book. This is in the first book in the intro in my testimony. And she says, you're going to be writing books. You're going to, you're going to write because you have a lot to share. You have a lot to say. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. So like a few months later, um, a brother who who uh, is was from that church who works with me kept saying, "Well, what's happening with the book? What's happening with?" I had to pray about a prayer, and I started writing. And it, it wasn't only when I started writing; I was like, my hand was 
flowing. And if I was typing something, my, my, it was flowing. Like that's how I knew the Holy Spirit was doing the writing and the typing. I knew it was from the Lord when it was forced, when I had brain freeze mm -hmm. and I couldn't think of what to write. It was like, I knew it was me forcing it and just being in my humanness, being in my flesh. So it was a prophetic word um, about this book and writing books. However, Another prophetic word was given two years later, almost two years later, we had a conference. A group of us gave a conference on the book. We took different chapters and we presented sessions on the different topics. So yeah. one sister in particular, she I call her my spiritual auntie or titi in Spanish. Um, her session, after she did her session, she says, you know what, Helene? And she spoke a word. She says, this book is, is, bless, is a blessing, but you're going to write a second book and that's going to be the book because it's the second one that God's really going to open those doors. And, and, mm. and I'm seeing that come to pass. And really that second book, as I said earlier, the first book was the theory. It was setting the stage. It was an exhortation to those who were in the Lord and, and evangelism to those who need the Lord and then exhorting them once they're in the Lord. But this second book is really, it's about joy coming in the morning, the grieving Everybody hurts, everybody mourns, everybody grieves. So prophetically, it was like that second book is going to speak to people uh, because we all hurt, hurt we all lose. Um, and there are testimonies in there, different losses, different losses, loss of, of spouse, loss of child, loss of parent, loss of pet, loss of job, loss of family, not in, in the natural, but more a severing of family, nice. um, loss of friends, loss of um, job, loss of uh, you, different types of losses because we grieve so many different ways. So it, it was relevant, practical, um, tangible but really it was real and it's and it's and it's raw you laugh with this book because there's stories about my family and you cry i had one brother who gave me he he read it after he lost his brother and he said i there was times i was laughing and there's times i was crying and both were therapeutic both both were therapeutic so the prophetic word um on both occasions and again, not everybody who speaks a word is, is a, it's a prophetic word from God. You have to discern and pray and fast and wait for further confirmations from people. Yes. You know, don't, don't, don't allow everybody to speak into your life and prophesy. You have to really be mindful of who is giving you that word. If are they operating prophetically? Are they operating in the Holy Spirit? Are they just pulling stuff? From anywhere, do they serve? Do they serve the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or who do they serve? Like, are they, and they're speaking yes. into your life, so you have to be careful. Now, these two people in particular, I knew meant business in the Holy Spirit. That's why yes. I took them seriously. I knew that they they saw what the Lord was doing, and they had that that ability. So again, you have the lesson learned is you have to discern and watch who you share with, but also discern who's giving the message and yes. what the message is. And really a lot of the times God is telling you this before someone even says it to you. He's prepping you. He's setting the stage. So a lot of those times you're, you're already, it's a confirmation of what God already put in your spirit. Um, yes. You know, like put a little seed in there. So that that's in terms of prophetic, those two books, that's how they manifest it. Oh, I love that. So no, but no before, no between a prophecy, prophecy and a prophet lie, basically. <laughs> no, but you know that this brother and sister in the Lord did prophesy this uh, and you knew in the spirit that it was time. And I just love that. If I could give a little testimony, though. Go, go. <laughs> you do that. You do that. <laughs> I want to say how important both books are. Um, but what one thing I love about joy comes in the morning that I think is really important to illustrate is I think sometimes when people are going through a loss, they feel alone, they feel isolated. The enemy can tell us, oh, you're the only one dealing with this pain right now. What was so powerful about that book uh, for me was that First of all, like you said, there were so many dips, different types of losses. But the other thing is that, you know, you're not the only one dealing with the loss. 
that in itself is ministry. When you can see someone's story, see how they have overcome that loss or are overcoming, you know, getting through that battle, that loss, that mourning. It's encouraging. No, you don't want pain for other people, but some, but sometimes it's a blessing to see how other people have processed and overcome mourning um, to get that joy. And it inspires you if you have mm. ever experienced loss, that your joy is coming as well. Amen. So I want to thank you for that book. It's such an important piece of work for anyone who is dealing with any type of loss. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that that word, that exhortation. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. And the song, and, and it it's a it's a secular song. It's not biblical. It just came up. Um, REM. It was back in the day. It's called Everybody Hurts. Everybody hurts mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. Everybody hurts, and, and sometimes you feel like nobody understands how deep this wound is, but then you read yes. these testimonies and these stories and, and you can relate and you can feel like, yes. and feel a little uplifted, even though, you know, morning's not going to go away in a snap of a finger, it, but it does come in the morning. It does. It does. Joy, yes. joy does come. Joy does come. And that allow yourself so important. to happen. Yeah. Wow. Amen to that. Amen to that. Joy. And, and the Bible says that we all know that's where your title comes from. Joy truly comes in the morning. It, it You don't have to stay there. And life does not do that. Um, in, eventually that joy comes. So just keep on holding on. Hold on to God. Hold on to God and keep praying and keep on having hope and your joy will come and is coming in Jesus name. So I just, Amen. yes, that's what one thing that really encouraged me about um, your second piece of work that was just amazing to me. So I encourage that to anyone dealing with the loss or anyone who's dealt with the trauma of loss, because sometimes you deal with loss and the trauma doesn't come till later on. Mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't, you, sometimes you're just getting through it and getting through that pain and surviving. And sometimes when you step back, then the trauma comes like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I went through that. And um, at that time as well, your your uh, second book really is, is a blessing. And so, well, one thing I wanted uh, to talk about too, sis. So uh, if you recall any of you who were there for our first session, with Helene when we talked about her two books. Uh, Helene calls, comes from a multicultural background. So there is history and culture uh, in your book. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's a foundation really of your books as well. Yeah, yeah, really. Um, the first book is An Eternal Affair. Um, again, yes. I feel like that's the theory. That's my firstborn. I always say that's my because I don't have children. I don't have I don't have biological children. I do have spiritual, you know, children, adopted children, God children. Yes. Um, yes. But um, an eternal fear is more. That's my firstborn. So you're always proud of your firstborn. You know, that was the <laughs> icebreaker. That was the icebreaker. You know, child. Um, yes. And then joy comes in the morning is my my second born, and there was a distance between the two births. Like I said, ten years of a diff of, of a difference um, in the times that they were written. So that my second born is special in a different way, more <laughs> profound way, because there was a lot of emotion in that. You know, yes. and really, the second book, even though the first book is chock full of scriptures, you know, it, that's why I say it's theory. It's more, more because it takes scripture and different topics within scripture dedicated what is prayer and fasting what is grace and mercy what is the lord's prayer what is what is giving you know just piece by piece on the lord's prayer um what is tithing you know really it's it's the basics in a sense you know so that's i give a lot of scripture and I talk about my family here and there and my life experiences. I give my testimony in the beginning and sprinkled throughout the book. There's there's stories um, about, you know, hanging out in the 90s and all things, things right. like that. Le lessons I learned from drinking um, yes. and God pulling on my coattails from there. You going out partying and drinking. It's like this is not what you, you should be doing. So mm -hmm. little things like that, little things which are cultural, you know, grew up with that. And and wow. yeah, that's part of the culture. So really, that first book gives you that that. Um, that taste. 
The second book um, really is the, the, I don't say the application, but I talk or I write, not talk, because it's not an it's not an, an audio book yet, but I, I write I write about um the family. And you know, some some um testimonies are private, they're they're um confidential, they're anonymous. Right. Or other others are, you know, I, I want to talk about my family because in a way it's a history book. Even though, and I look at it as I, I read that book and it's a short read, it's 125 pages. But it short doesn't mean that it's not as um, important or is not as deep. It's a deep book. Yes, it is. Um, to the point where my own sister, I she and there's a chapter on her, her story. And I said, I would say to her, well, what chapter are you up to? Did you finish reading yet? And she said, this is really heavy. So this is not an easy read. She's like, it's not yeah. easy. I'm digesting it. I'm taking it slowly because it's, it's, we're talking about loss. And it was, she's, she's yes. reading about the losses that are in our family and our circle. So uh, really it's, it's a history book talking about different seasons of my life, growing up with tradition of what would, uh, you know, the family that we would have over Christmas Eve, growing up with my brother cousins who now live in Florida, they, they had a loss very early in their life. My grandmother, I talk about my grandmother in the first book, and then I bring her into the second book. She's the first chapter in the second book because she's the yeah. matriarch. She's the grand poobah or the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the big kahuna of the family, right. the, 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 the donya of the family. So that's what I mean by it's a history book, and it really is our history and the testimony. There's a, there's a scripture Revelation 12, 11, mm -hmm. um, they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Um, and that's in Revelation, which is the last book of the New Testament. But I, I there's a chapter in my first book that is dedicated to that. Um, you know, his blood, meaning Jesus's blood, but your story, mm -hmm. you know, the blood of the lamb. But it, what is your testimony? How did you get to Christ? What did God take you through and bring you through for you to have a testimony and a story to tell others? how yes. he came to Christ. So my grandmother's testimony is in that first book, but she kicks off after the introduction, she kicks off the second book because she has had, had, she's deceased now, major losses in her life. Mm -hmm. And that's the his, that's our history and that's our ministry in a sense, our family. Yes. So it's special to me, very special. Well, and speaking of your grandmother, why don't we get into her special testimony? Do you, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. In An Eternal Affair, which is the first book, um, there is a chapter. I mentioned her in that book, and the chapter is chapter 15, and it's called Trading Our Sorrows. Mm -hmm. And I kick off that chapter with the scripture Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. And I'll read that now, and then I'm going to get into her testimony, which yes. is in that book. And then Joy Comes in the Morning, she's featured again. So really kicking off, because I want to set the stage for her testimony and why I reference Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, when it comes to her. Um, so that scripture I took from the Amplify, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed and commissioned me to bring good news to the humble and afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted, to proclaim release from confinement and condemnation to the physical and spiritual captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance and retribution of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion the following, to give them a turban instead of the dust of their heads, a sign of mourning, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment expressive of praise instead of a disheartened spirit. So they will be called trees of righteousness, strong and magnificent, distinguished for integrity, justice and right standing with God, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. So really I kick off that first, that chapter, chapter 15 in the first book, with that scripture and then reference later in that chapter, my grandmother's testimony. And I'm going to share that now. Right. Um, I'm going to do this without, I won't cry because um, even though she's gone in October will be 13 years. Yeah. We still talk about her regularly. So we feel like it just happened last year. Yeah. Really. She's yeah. always with us. They're always with us in heart, mind and, and spirit. 
So true. So I'm going to read her testimony. It may take about five minutes or so. And we have that time. Because <laughs> I, I really, I'm so, who who thought, she's probably like, wow, I never thought my story would be yes. in a book and, and be talked about. My so God. I want to honor her. I want to honor her today. Yes, thank I call, you. Thank you. Thank you. I call my grandmother a modern day Job. And if you know the story of Job in the book of Job, read it so you can relate uh, what I'm saying. I have to share her testimony in order to clearly illustrate the different seasons in our lives and how God will bring restoration, the beauty for ashes. Granny, I call her Granny, uh, even though I say my grandmother, she's Granny. Um, granny lost her husband suddenly of a heart attack when she was 52 mm -hmm. after 30 years of marriage. So we're going to start off with that. A month later, her father died, and then her mom died years before that. So really, um, my grandmother was left without her mother, father, and husband at the young age of 52. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's that's mourning right there. She's had three, you know, two losses back to back, and then her mom, and our moms are precious to us. So she's coming in at 52 years old with with these heavy with this heaviness. Mm -hmm. And I'm 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 adding as I'm reading. Yes, yes. Um so basically, um, two years later, or less than two years later, after my grandfather, her husband passed, her 27-year-old daughter, who was my aunt, a mother of two young sons, collapsed and died of a heart attack. So my grandmother lost a daughter, 27 years old, who had two young children very early. She was 27. Um devastated, Granny quit her job, she was working at the time, and stepped in to help her son-in-law raise the two boys. Life settled a bit for her, and some years later, Granny met a nice man who became her companion. Now, my grandfather died before I was born, so I didn't have my grandfather. Mm -hmm. But this companion was kind of sort of that grandfather for us, so yeah. I wanted to honor him as well, because he was really special. So she had a companion, and and life was kind of picking up for her after that loss or those losses. However, in 1978, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and had to have a mastectomy. So that's a loss right there, a loss of a body part, what makes you a woman, what makes you, they said, like, that's your womanhood. Yes. Um, she had to have a mastectomy. And she bounced back from that battle with radiation and the Lord's grace. So she kind of, she pushed through that too with the Lord, mm -hmm. uh, another loss. She bounced back. Um, and then in 1989, some years later, about almost 10 years later, maybe more, Granny experienced another blow when her only son, my uncle, who was the oldest, he died of bone cancer at age 48. So she lost another child. So to you, anybody knows when you have children, when you outlive your children, that is a, a punch to the gut like no other. Okay. Yes. So she's she now she's no husband, two she's lost two children. My mom is her only only child left. Shortly thereafter, okay, so we're getting into the 90s now. Shortly thereafter, each of my grandmother's siblings died, like at practically at the rate of one sibling per year, because she had a big family. Um, over the course of the next two decades, my grandmother lost friends um, to old age and health related issues, including that companion that I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, who had been in her life for 20 years. So she really has had loss along the way, really, in her lifetime. Um, she also mm -hmm. developed in her later years macular degeneration, which is a loss of vision and a loss of hearing in both her ears. Um so, and, and as I wrote this uh, four years ago, meaning when I wrote this, so four years prior to my writing this, she was near death with pneumonia and septic kidneys. So she was in the hospital. They were writing her off. You know, it's like, fill out these forms. Do not resuscitate. You're on your way out. Okay. Mm -hmm. She was what? 91 years old at the time, but God kept her and healed her, which he deemed, uh, which we deem miraculous, yes. um, especially by doctors and nurses, because, you know, for the most part, doctors and nurses are kind of like looking for the scientific. Science. They, don't look at, they don't look at the miracle. They don't look at the spirit. So they were like, how did that happen? I'm like, people were praying. We were te mm -hmm. texting prayer warriors and praying in the hospital. So she right. made a comeback. She really, she's back. 91, she fought death and God kept her. God kept her here. Okay, that's not it. That's not the end of the story. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then 
what we thought would be the straw that broke the camel's back for her was when my mother died of a heart attack almost two years um, after, you know, before the, this book, after this book was written, mm -hmm. um, which was brought on by heart complications due to diabetes. Now, at this stage, all three of my granny's children, my mother and her two siblings, were gone. Every one of her children are gone. Like, I feel like she could relate to Job, really. Mm -hmm. yes. um, but she, it's something that she thought she would never have to experience in her lifetime. All three are gone. Her husband's gone. Her children are gone. But she handled it the best way she could as she handled everything else with God's grace yet again. After my mom's death and with my granny's consent, my family decided that placing her in a nursing facility would be the best scenario for her now um, so that she would have people to watch her and it would have community. Mm -hmm. So she left her apartment, her loss of independence, um, dug her heels in and went into the nursing home and made a life there for almost two years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to read, you know, so much more. I just want to get to the, the heart of where I'm going with this. Um, she battled lung complications at the end, um, lung cancer. And um, at the end, you know, she, her heart was tenderized. She was, she was, she was feisty. My grandma was feisty. Yeah. <laughs> um, but really, um, you know, she, when she was in that nursing home, when she was fighting illness, and I'm going to paraphrase in the interest of time, basically, I, I knew she knew the Lord. I knew she knew God. She took us to church. She was, you know, Catholic. We went to church with her and so on and so forth. But I needed to know that she was born again. I needed to know that Christ was in her heart because this was, this was going to be it pretty soon when she had the lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So one day in the nursing home, I crawled into bed with her. Oh. And I stood over her and Liz knows this because we prayed about it in our yes. prayer time that year. Yes. Um, and I said, Granny, I have a, I have a prayer for you. I want to pray over you. And if you hear me, let me know. And I prayed and she was all oh, that was beautiful. Oh, my goodness. I said, do you believe what I wrote, what I read? Yes, of course. That was beautiful. So I knew that even though she didn't recite that prayer, she felt it. She 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 experienced it. Mm -hmm. And she knew the Lord that she whatever was going on in her heart that I knew she knew Jesus, Jesus was in her heart. She was ready to go. She was ready to go. So really at 95, you know, I had that moment with her to this day is still very tender and special to me. So I'm going to share a little bit and we have, we have a little bit of time. Yes, please. When you, when you hear my grandmother's testimony, this, I'm going to read a bit. When you hear, you hear lots of ashes, you hear lots of mourning, you hear lots of heaviness. Where's the beauty? Where's yes. the beauty for the ash? Like, right. And I've always asked myself, it's like, where's the double portion and the everlasting joy? And I would ask God that over the years, it's like, wow, this woman has been through hell and back for lack of a better word. Um, where's the double portion? Now, my grandmother to me is a legend and not in the Hollywood sense. Right. She's a legend because she didn't give up the fight and she never cursed God. Like Job, she never cursed God. Everybody said, curse God and die. Mm -hmm. She was a widow at a young age. She um, really spent the last years of her life, the sole survivor of her families, her, her immediate family growing up, and then her husband and her children. She was there for us, um, her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. I, and I even said to her, Gran, Granny, when you're ready to go, you're going to have family in heaven, but you have family down here that matter and care, and we, we still need you. That's why you're here, you yes. know? And there were times that I would um, wonder, it's like, is she bitter toward the Lord? I'm going to paraphrase now. Mm -hmm. She was, are you, are you angry at God? I've, I had to ask her that one time. Are you angry mm -hmm. at God for what happened to you? She said, no, I'm not. I was like, are you just telling me that? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, I'm not. I'm not. And I never heard her angry. She always said God and God, God willing, and it's God's will. And, and um, it's what God wants. Mm -hmm. You know, she always used those phrases. So I knew she had God. I knew she yes. had God. I just wanted to know he was in the center of the heart and he was the Lord of her life. That's right. um, so she had a wonderful marriage to my grandfather. She had wonderful children, beautiful stories, traditions that still exist. 
you know, that's the beauty for the ashes. And again, read the rest of the story. I, I can't, we're in the interest of time and I want to read too much, but now you have to buy both books so you can yes. read stories <laughs> that appear in both. But really that's the, that's the beauty for the ashes, the rich heritage, the memories, the family, the friends, the trophy of grace that is my grandmother who didn't give up the fight and never cursed God and died. She, she blessed God and, and, and prayed to God and taught us, took us to church in our, yes. those early years. And I'm, I'm in the Lord because of that early foundation. God set those, those steps for us and yes. set the stage for us to know the Lord because she took us to church. So really that's um, basically, and I end with a scripture, blessed and, and enviably happy are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Mm -hmm. um, so my grandmother pushed forward. She never let things get her down. Strongest woman we know. And, and I, our family, it's its unanimous. We all feel the same way. So that's in a nutshell. I, I talked like I was double parked. Forgive me. No. That's the story. That's the story. It's such a blessed. You know what? Sis, your grandmother truly was a legend. You, you mentioned that. She was a pillar of strength. This woman never gave up on life. She kept on going and she left a remarkable legacy because of her faith. I look at you and I've, I, I look at the legacy, the legacy that she brought in your life to love the Lord. Look at what has come about in your life with regards to ministry, how you have impacted Pace University, how you've impacted your city of, you know, uh, NYC. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It matters. Her not giving up. And I love the fact that you asked her, do you ever get mad at the Lord? It's such a fair question for anyone who might be feeling like they're being beaten up year after year, year after year please get this book because it truly is an inspiration. Your grandmother, and there's so many other stories, but that story yeah. is so impactful because I think sometimes we think that we have the worst case scenario until we look at someone else and realize, my gosh, I really am blessed. And your, yes. and your grandmother even look at her situation and see the blessings out of that the history of your family, the legacy, the children. Um, you know, she's just such an amazing woman and such an amazing story. And I'm so happy that you included her in both books. No, she, she, had, that she, honor. <laughs> she had to be chapter one in the, in the second book. Like that's, yes. really, that, that's the origin of, and that's really over the years between the first book and the second book is what am I going to write about that people are going to resonate with? What, you know, and it's like grief, loss, because I, you know, it really, we all lose and everybody could relate. There, there are other grannies out there. And it just looks yeah. differently, but, but anytime, and, and I use that story and my mom obviously lo had losses along the way with my grandmother because they, they both yeah. lost together. And my mother's story is in, in the books as well, but really my grandmother, I use that story a lot and I use it not for my glory or her glory, but forgot to relate to people, to exhort people, to be able to connect with them, to say, like if someone loses a child, when someone loses a family, especially a child. I talk about my grandmother because it's like we've experienced that in our family. It really is, it is, it's a it's a devastation. Yes. However, joy does come in the morning. There's a pain, I'm sure, that will never go away because that child is not on this earth anymore. And you and if you if you both know Jesus, you're gonna see each other again. But I, I don't have a child, but my the closest to a child that I have is my niece, who's my, my, my goddaughter. And, you know, she's, she's like my daughter, yes. but I feel like to, to fathom, I can't fathom losing her. I, mm. I can't. Mm. So yeah, like to lose it, it's devastating. And do you ever get over it? No, I don't think you do. You manage and joy does come. There are joyous yes. moments of God's going to bring you other things, other people, other experiences in your walk, in your path. But that it, it's that's it's a loss. And Liz, you have two children. You know, it's like, like 
But, so I always bring up my grandmother's story. And sometimes yeah. I'll reference the book to people, depending who they are and what their faith is and what my relationship is. I'll recommend the book because, yes. hey, read the story. It's going to help you. Um, and that's the tool that none of us ever thought that we would use as a ministry tool. Yes. You know, the beauty for the ashes. There is beauty. There is joy. Absolutely. And your stories in your first and second book, talking about your life story, talk about, uh, talking about the morning and the joy that comes from the morning and other people's lives in your second story, you can see that book writing and authoring books coming from the Lord can open the doors of ministry. So can you talk a little bit about what you've experienced in writing uh, these books and how it has further opened up doors to ministry? Definitely. Um, teaching, um, as I mentioned, you know, ministry, not in the church sense, but ministering to others, recommending the book, sharing the story, yes. um, speaking, speaking, whether it's at a church or um, we used to have a ministry Christian fellowship at Pace um, where I would speak. We had a conference. We had two conferences at Pace through Christian Fellowship where we presented on different topics with the book. Um, you know, there are um, there are other things coming on the horizon that I'm yeah. going to be speaking at women's groups, um, ministries for girls, young girls, and then women's groups that I'm going to be speaking at to share um, the, 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 the grief, the story, because these books are about the Lord. They're, they're faith-based, but especially that second book, that second book is yeah. really going to touch hearts and, and, um, soothe the bomb, the hurting mom that is in the heart. And, and really God has opened up doors and he's going to open up more doors now. And that's why this, this session today is so timely because I'm getting ready to launch more of those speaking engagements yes. um, to talk about the books and talk about what the Lord has done and what he, what he is going to do. So really ministry um, within the four walls of a church ministry, even in the workplace, as I mentioned, having, having Christian fellowship and having conferences um, ministry in the day to day, your colleague, your classmate, your friend, um, you know, I would, I would tap into my mom when she was alive and say, so-and-so lost a family member. Can you talk like you, you know, you know it better than I, now I know it because yeah. I've had so much loss since then, but she would tap in and, and be that minister. Like there's a few people my mother ministered to because she, like my mother experienced a lot of loss mm -hmm. and kept it moving with the grace of God. So really it, it doesn't always have to be church ministry or, um, a ministry or a nonprofit that's faith based. Yeah, those are those are important, and and I value those, and I'm and I are, are involved in those. But the day to day ministry of how you can share yes. and evangelize for people yes. who don't who don't know Christ. I mean, these are faith based. So like maybe they're of a different. I gave this book to someone, and and the person was a Muslim, and I said, listen, and I prefaced it with, I know you your your practice Islam. This is faith based can I give this to you? And they, and they can say yay or nay. This right. particular person said, I have a Bible, even though I, I'm a, the Quran is my word. I have, I own a Bible, right. you know? Yeah. I was, and that person was open. Now, if the person is not open, then, then maybe they don't want the book. That's okay. You have to respect where people are and discern and say, okay. And you did your part. You wanted to share the gospel through the, through these works and it didn't work, but person who's Muslim, person who's Jewish, you know, we don't, other faiths might be like, wow, you yes. know, and, 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 uh, and it's an evangelism tool, not only just exhortation, both books. So for anyone out there who, if you believe that the Lord is calling you to write, it might really, like Helene was saying, open up the doors to ministry, uh, and not just with the people, you know, but people you don't know, uh, people mm -hmm not Christian, this might open up the doors um, for evangelism. And I know you've gotten some feedback and testimonies from your books. And this is where the life changing aspect comes from, from writing uh, when the Lord has called you to write. So can you talk about some of the testimonies? Yeah. 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 You know, um, like I said earlier, I had a brother in Christ 
who works with me and and I had given him this book when his brother passed away his only brother it's just two yeah, siblings yeah. and his brother passed so I I can I, I can imagine I have a I have siblings and I'm very close with them so picture life without your sibling right um so gave him the book and you know you give people the book they buy the book they don't always read it right away so I wasn't mm-hmm. getting a lot of feedback from people I'm like yo you know give me some encouragement let me know what's happening yeah. So he he was one of the first people because the book had just come out a few months before that. Mm -hmm. He was one of the first people who gave me. And and of course, Liz, you gave me. You're always better, Liz. But a lot of people were not. I wasn't. They weren't ringing the bell like to let me. I needed to know. I needed to know. Is it too heavy? Is it is it is it? Am I a black cloud? Like what is like? Is it is it healthy? No, so this brother in particular went on vacation and he read it while he was on vacation. And he says, I read it on the beach and I cried a certain chapters. I cried certain chapters. I laughed out loud to, and my wife was like, what are you laughing at? I had to share share your book. So that, and he doesn't even know, I told him, and he doesn't even know the magnitude and the level that he blessed me by sharing that exhortation with me because he laughed, he cried. It it ministered to him, it soothed him. It, it didn't take the pain away completely, but it's like, wow, like I, and he sees me differently. And I was like, wow, I didn't know all that. And he says, the one thing that's missing are the pictures of your family. There's no pictures oh, in the book. Yes. So what I did was send him pictures of people yes. who were featured in the book, the ones I could share with others who are, who are, who are anonymous. But the oh, ones right. who like I named, I show, I shared pictures with him. He goes, oh, now I have the names with the faces and, <laughs> and it helped him. Like he really was invested in it. And mm. other people, wow, I didn't know your family went through that. Wow, I wow, I didn't know your story. Wow. And then some people, you write so well, like you write like so and so. And they would name, they would name like like pastors of, of mega churches. I'm like, wow, like yes. I'm pat myself. <laughs> I'm pat. And it was like oh, my head was oh. But no, no, it was, it was, I need to be encouraged. When you encourage others, you need to be encouraged. You need it. So those, that was the feedback that I had gotten. Like, wow, well done. Like, this is really good stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, that's an encouragement to all of you who God is calling you to write a book. Our stories, people, when they see us on the outside, they might think one thing, but like you just said, this gentleman, this brother in Christ, he was able to look at you in a different way and he could see something in you. And so our books can really change and impact lives. So get started on that book of God is calling you to do some writing. And well, you know, one thing before we end, I, I wanted to ask you, I know that there was some loss that came from after writing the books. Can you talk a little bit about that? Some loss. I mean, people after the book was written, the, the second book was right. written in 2022, January 2022. Yes. Um, and right after the book was published, my father got really sick. It was that was that was the spiritual warfare. That was that was a battle right there because he was it wasn't looking good. And it was like, what is this right after on the heels the week after? Bam, he was in the hospital. Yes. And I'm like, Whoa. All right. So he made it. Praise God. He's still alive. I plead the blood of Jesus over him. But losses, losses, a brother who is featured in the book, him and his wife, I feature them in the the chapter, second book called A Family Affair. Very dear to our family. He passed away. He, he, I talked about his family and then he, we found out right after the book was published, he was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer and he, he died. Yes. Um, and then a couple of other people died after the book who, with whom I was estranged mm-hmm. from. Um, so that brought up things for me. It's like I didn't end the relationships well. I never resolved the relationships and now they're gone. So there's lessons to learn there, too. Like, what are the what are the coping strategies? How do I resolve this when the person's not here anymore? And I never got to say, hey, I was wrong or I turned my back on you or I walked away from you and I you never resolved it. So that I had to go through that, too, you know. So I had to kind of like minister to myself and like, Lord, how do I resolve this? Because I, I don't, I don't always do the right thing. 
and you think people are going to be here forever. And then the, when they pass away, you feel awful because yeah. you never resolved the issues and you yeah. never made it right, especially if you were in the wrong for turning away. So those were the losses. But also I want to share something that's going to be something that I'm going to be ministering about um, when I'm going on these these uh, speaking engagements. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at a women's retreat. And I'll be brief because we want to wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, the the assignment, I had to get feedback from three people. You know, there was different questions these three people had to answer about me before the retreat. Um, and I got the feedback. One of the people, and I didn't expect this from this one person, it was very profound feedback, but I wasn't expecting it. He said, sometimes you may make your identity your loss, which is may not be good. I'm and sure. I'm like, ooh, all yeah. right. And I had to check that, like sometimes our ministry or our what it, what we're writing about, what we're talking about. Hi, my name is Helene. I've had X, Y, and Z losses. That's not who you are. That's what you've experienced. And he says, don't make your identity your loss. And I have that mm -hmm. message. That's that's a part three, maybe, and that's going to be yes. something I'm going to teach, I'm going to teach at a at a retreat. Yes. Don't make your identity your loss. Your loss, your identity. Let me flip it. Don't make your loss your identity. Identity. Oh, make your ministry, in a sense, and ministry is that you're 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 walking alongside of other people and and giving them the word. Don't make that your identity. And I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, let's say that one more time. Let, let's make, well, say, I'll let you say, I don't want to mess it up. Do not make your loss. Do not make your loss. Your identity. Your identity. Oh my gosh. And that's something that this young, he was a young brother in Christ and I wasn't expecting him to drop that on me. He's like, don't, you, you tend to do that. He goes, don't make that your identity. Cause there's so much more to me. There's so much. That's what he was saying. It was an exhortation. Initially, I was like, what does that mean? But, oh, <laughs> but I had to take a step back and it's like, he's right. And that's a message. And I'll, I'm going to expound upon that and, and give more, at, you know, when I'm speaking. Yes. So how, how, how do you not do that? How do you make if even if it's a ministry and a test, you're yes. sharing your testimony, how do you not make that your identity? That is so profound. That, that is so profound. Do not make your loss your identity. Let that be an encouragement to everyone here. I know that encouraged me. <laughs> and loss in any doesn't have to be loss of, of yes. a, through death, loss of a job, loss of a, a okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 something, I'm not 20 something anymore. Loss of youth, loss yes. of whatever. Don't make that your identity. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for that. Oh, I love that. We we will end right there. But <laughs> before we end, yeah, well, I was just thinking before we end, I want everyone to have the chance to hop on your website. Can you, in the last three minutes, talk about what you have to offer in cruise control coaching? Yes, yes. CruiseControlCoaching.com. Um, mainly in this season, we're doing more grief counseling or coaching rather, not counseling. Yes. Um, there's a difference. There's a difference. Um, and I encourage those who are in mourning, those who have are grieving. There's nothing wrong with therapy and coaching, uh, uh, therapy and, and counseling along with coaching. Yes. There, to marry the two together, it's, it's a, a wonderful thing. Um, and then there's career, the career part from a faith based perspective. Now, what I do at Pace University, that's my full time. That's my that's my jam. You know, yes. that's me. That's my day to day. But this is career coaching from a, from a, a faith based perspective, as well as grief coaching. So you can find me at Cruise Control Coaching. I'll be opening up business soon, but you can check out the website and then you can purchase the books through Amazon. If you go through the website, there's a link to Amazon. Amen. So in this last minute that we have, can you close out and pray? Oh right. for you know I don't, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I don't pray. I don't pray quick. But we have to. <laughs> yeah, we have to. Okay. Father God, I just come in the name of Jesus and I say hallelujah for the session, Lord. You were in it, Lord. Thank you that we are on our internal affair with eternal affair with you. And joy does come in the morning. 
I thank you for every listener. I pray that they will check the, out the website, but most importantly, check you out, Lord, and walk very closely with you and hear from you and hear what thus saith the Lord in this season for them. If they're going to be writing a book, if they're going through a loss, whatever the issue that they're going to cling to you and seek your guidance and your direction, Father God. Thank you for the words that you gave Liz and I to give encouragement, yeah. to give scripture, to just shine a light on our viewers today. And I pray that if part three is in the works, let us do it. Yes. In Jesus' name, I thank you for Liz, and I, I just pray a blessing over everybody who's watching today, and, and in the name of Jesus, I come, amen, amen, and amen. Amen, Woo! amen. So www.cruisecontrolcoaching.com, and my sister, Helene, thank you. Thank you. As always. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. You can uh, find me at www.kingdomelegance.com. And I'm on YouTube as well. Uh, God bless you all. I am so encouraged. And we will talk to you soon. Have a blessed, blessed day and a blessed week ahead. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. <laughs>